Welcome once again to Syntax Error, your pretentious philosophical pedantic podcast ostensibly about video gaming and related topics therein. Warning, this podcast contains mature language, content, and spoilers. You have been warned. And welcome back to A Brief History of the End of Days. My name is Jonathan Ian Manser, and with me, Scott Thurlow. Hey, oh. Sina Ramosi. We're back. And Christopher Morgan. How you doing? So, in the last episode, we discussed the meat of a uh, space apocalypse. And now, we'd like to go into more of like a philosophical bent. The, the root of apocalypse is in prophecy. And truly, the prophecies of our time uh, is science fiction. And from space invaders to interstellar, all have spoken to what we may face in the future. So I'd like to, uh, this is going to be less of a kind of a structured format and more of an open forum to discuss in this topic. So, uh, Scott, would you like to begin? You sure you really want that kind of format? I'm just kidding. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so you ask me, like, what predictions precisely do I think are interesting or? However you wish to take it. it. Well, I think, of course, as I sort of touched upon uh, last uh, episode uh, in part one, is that it all depends upon basically the almost the, the Jungian subconscious zeitgeist of humanity. And also, of course, I would say the march of science, as I like to bring up a lot. Like, you know, e because technology advances almost faster than perhaps humanity, you can, we can talk about, you know, futurism, etc., things like that, which I think are relevant to this conversation. But because of the nature, in fact, of technology itself, that the predictions of even like maybe five years ago could some of them are outdated certainly like some of the old like the, the xerus kind of stuff that uh the 50s the the, the, the height of the 50s 60s like sci-fi like sort of rag magazines if you will you know popular science like stuff like that um all the things that like asimov was published in a number of things etc highland too you know it, it's it's kind of jarring to go back and read some of that stuff yes the stories are still good but like the science it's based on is completely outdated at this point so the predictions are going to be completely you know you, you can't you know the predictions are, are like by default of course going to be wrong well i always love some the, of them the world of tomorrow yeah um, sure exactly yeah precisely it's it's sort of something like that uh, chris um that's a good question <laughs> i had a thought um and like that it was gone and like that it was gone we're speaking of prophecy then or uh, in a sense, how science fiction views the future, and what our favorite or speculative fiction. Okay, as you like yeah, to okay, yeah. With regard to speculative fiction, what what I, it's really funny because I don't think they get this science wrong. Like earlier, science wrong as as much like conceptually they get it right. Like I'll agree with that. If, yeah, if you look at, I mean, look, go back to the first Twilight Zone episode. Where the guy thinks he's alone on the earth, and it turns out there's where is steady, everyone? I'm yeah, where is everyone? And basically, they knew right then and there, even though like all the other a lot of Twilight Zone episodes contradicted it, they knew it would have to, it would be like months between here and Mars. Um, but like you know, if you go to anything like obviously Star Star Wars or Star Trek again, um, or um. I don't know any one of uh, speculative fiction that that's predicted the future. I don't think conceptually they're wrong. Um, I think they get the timetables wrong. Like somehow it's like that's okay, sort of what I was going. Yeah, to. we we got all these advances, and like you know, in the last fifteen years, I've had a phone that couldn't take a picture to a phone that's basically more powerful than the computer I had ten years ago. Um, mm -hmm. But um, oh, I was. Darn, I had some ideas, and I, I had some examples. I can't, I don't have them right now. Well, we'll get back to you then, Steve. -o. Um, I think, I think what's interesting about this topic is kind of uh, viewing science as the harbinger, or science fiction, I guess, as the harbinger of the future, and uh, trying to take that. I think a lot of what science fiction does um, is looks at what's going on in its own present. And then just adds like wacky shit to it, basically. And, and maybe that's, I think that's the, I think a lot of the best stuff does that because that's the best way to do things. Because really, the thing that's never going to change throughout your stories is the human 
component. You can add a ray gun and a, you know a spaceship, mm. and the people are still going to interact the same. And that's what's got to hit your readers or viewers or you know gamers first, and then they can be like, "Oh shit, that's a cool fucking ray gun," you know. Um, so you're saying sort of like secondary in that sense. Yeah, I mean, they're, the si- themes are broad. Science fiction has but the details are s- science fiction, or even you know. Uh, projected science has promised a lot of things that it's failed on as much as the things that it's, you know, succeeded on. Where are my flying cars, dude? Where are my (laughs) fucking jetpacks? You know? You you, you can uh, hook yourself up to your drone and fly away. Um, (laughs) But I wasn't necessarily talking about uh, technological advances as I was about how we philosophically deal with the unknown of the future. Uh, in a sense, you could take Star Wars, which deals with a lot of classical elements sure. of uh, science fiction and adventure theories. And it, preve- it presents you, even though it takes place a long, long, whatever time ago, it's still a futuristic a society. And it shows you that for all the futurism, there's still the idea of politics. There's all good guys and bad guys. Sure. There's still, uh, Star Trek dealt with kind of a fun look and exploration that the idea that like we have nothing to fear about the future yes there are going to be challenges and there are going to be things, but it's about exploration it's about having a sense of adventure um you Battlestar Galactica dealt with um the the uh, universe where you're alone but and our own uh, ingenuity destroys us I was, I was gonna say that we were talking about apocalyptic events in science fiction and I don't think Glenn Larson realized the the full potential he had. And I, when they, I'm assuming you're talking about the new Battlestar Galactica. Uh, yes, uh, who's okay. Glenn, uh, Glenn Larson created the original uh, Battlestar Galactica, and Ronald D. Moore realized that, like, hey, you know, given the time and they're trying to compete with Star Wars, you know, it was kind of more of an action thing. But philosophically, it's 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 an apocalyptic event. It's our, you know, man's except. In the original, um, the Cylons were aliens, but in the new version, Cylons were created by man. And you know, I was just going back to them, like, oh yeah, here's that, here's that apocalyptic event we were talking about, because there was a civilization that was demolished and was set out to the stars. Oh, and although uh, the reason I didn't bring that up in our original discussion is because although it is a an apocalyptic event that uh, they're not quite human, but they're uh, uh, I guess the descendants of humans or whatever uh, the Balsar Gothica uh, history is. But it's more of a technological apocalypse. It's more in line with iRobot and those mm-hmm. kind of um, apocalypses than necessarily the alien interstellar, even though it takes place in well, space. Well, the funny thing is, um, I'm not gonna, I don't want to spoil it because... I, 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 we already I, warned about spoilers. We already, uh, but what Battlestar Galactica ultimately becomes the end of it is what we're talking about with regard to prophecy and the cycle of time and all sorts of, one of the things that they always say that they said, I think right off the beginning is all this has happened before all this will happen again. And a lot of it, they did derive from like, you know, Christian mythology where, or, you know, or basic human mythology, because a lot of the first Testament's based on ancient Mesopotamian. Um, but you've got the you've got these stories that are told all over again. You've got events that are similar from the cycle of time. So I, when we're talking about you know um, cycles and we're talking about prophecy and we're talking about apocalyptic events, Battlestar Galactica is another example of something that in in this frame you can talk about politics, society, religion, um, and getting back to what science fiction does best. What science fiction has always done is be able to discuss issues you cannot discuss in public. I mean, uh, Beth Otherwise, and I... Otherwise, without the media, without yeah, the filter through that genre. Beth and I rewatched the original series a couple years ago, and there's one part, I can't remember, was Kirk or McCoy was talking to some one of the guys, because they're an overpopulated planet, and they were actually going to introduce a disease into it voluntarily so that members of the society would die off. They'd volunteer to die off so the greater good could live. And in the course of this conversation... They were ta- they talked like um, euthanasia versus the death penalty versus abortion in like in like five lines. Beth and I were like holy shit, because but you put it in the context of a science fiction setting, and you can and have always been able to talk about anything you want, and it gets by the censors because 
as long as it's not happening in this time, as long as there's no direct A to B correlation, you can get away with it. I think there's something interesting to be found in the sense of, uh, you know, comparing it to generations ago. Something like, uh, you mentioned it, you kind of stole my line, I was going to say. The sense of adventure versus maybe the sense of cynicism that comes about, from, you know, from generation to generation. Like, you know, back in the, the, you know, the world of tomorrow kind of thing, it was a great, you know, a grand sense of humanity will go out and conquer, and not even conquer, just explore and, you know, enlighten themselves. Now it's more like, we're probably fucked. Like, you know, the, the weird kind of zeitgeist thing, again, about that, like, what pop culture mentality seems to sway, like, what's informed by these, like, what these works are informed by, that kind of mentality and, and vision and mindset uh, uh, from, you know, from generation to generation within sci-fi. Well, actually, it's interesting you said that because one of the topics I wanted to bring up was um, how science fiction has developed through the years, how it's changed in the messages. So I, I do agree that there is a part of uh, science fiction that really speaks to current issues. Um, and uh, even equally, maybe even more, I'd admit, perhaps depending on the series, to the idea of speculation about the future. Um I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but, Got sucked out by the aliens. So what was the topic you just brought up before that? Um, A sense of uh, cynicism versus optimism. Yeah, so how like? how uh, now I'm not very qualified to speak of this as I've had uh, brief um, uh, touches with science fiction throughout the years. But how has science fiction changed throughout your experiences? Um, well, I I can I can speak to that a little bit i mean like the, my first uh jump into science fiction and now I, I i'm gonna just talk about space science fiction because you can talk about all different kinds of things like i read jurassic park when i was in like fourth grade but that doesn't really that's not really on topic so much um but probably ender's game is the first book that i remember being sci-fi and that was like defying your sense of sci-fi right and that was you know written in the 80s or 70s i think it was started in the 70s and came out in the 78 i I don't remember anyway um that book was all about humans you know conquering all and like but it touched upon the theme of like whether or not that was the best thing for everybody and, uh, you know, probably came down a little bit on the side of probably not. Um, you know, I, I saw Star Wars when I was pretty young. That was another, like, you know, the human spirit is going to conquer and, like, the, you Prevails, know, of course. A lot more lately, you've been seeing movies like uh, Interstellar where it's like, you know... Uh, I actually won't spoil this one because I know a couple of you guys haven't seen it yet and oh, are looking free. forward to it. Yeah. But, you know, that's more of like a... It's more of a downer in terms of what's going on in, in humanity. That's kind of what I was saying, cynicism versus optimism. You know, right. sci-fi you, informs itself through those... I think you, I think you are definitely seeing more cynicism these days mm-hmm. than, than you used to in sci-fi. Uh, uh, one of the things I loved about Interstellar and I got right away and... I, with regard to the soundtrack to the to everything, it, it is definitely the main influence was two thousand and one, and I think Interstellar and two thousand and one, about all the comparisons I can put between them and all the ways they succeed, I think the one thing they do have in common is the fact that they simultaneously get are cynical and optimistic. Mm, they, that's they, interesting. They they combine perfectly. Um, they slice a, through both. Yeah, a sense of Two renewal, uh, mm-hmm. that the humanity will survive, that there's things beyond us that we know. But also, there's things about it that, in various aspects of the story in various times, man has ultimately fucked himself. Whether it's, we're talking about <laughs> a two-man crew with four hibernating scientists, or a civilization. Like I said, both films do a really good job of being both optimistic and pessimistic at the same time. That's true. I, I agree with that. That's sort of like, you know, you get, it's more nuanced in that sense. Like, it's, it's, I was sort of filtering through a dichotomy, like, either you're one or the other. Right. You know? But that's true. You can take slices of both and sort of have a, like, combination of them to filter through. But I want to remember something interesting. You guys might remember, it, again, the, viewed through tropes. It's sort of like another dichotomy, but we can explore. It's either humans are bastards or the aliens are bastards, like, in that sense, right? Like, aliens, like, I'll, I'll filter also a, a subject through Twilight Zone, which is my favorite things ever to exist. And I'll bring it back to something that you got, 
Ian, I think you touched on earlier. I don't remember the episode, but you guys certainly remember where there was a bus crash. And they're trying to figure out who is the Will the real Martians yes, please stand that's out? The na- yes, exactly, right? And it was Martians versus, like, Venusians, people from Venus, warring over how to best colonize, or who's going to colonize Mars first. And humans were completely unaware, like, you know, they were being caught in the middle of two, what is implied to be, of course, advanced civilizations, who are already one up on them either way. Or it's that alien, whatever alien, uh, you know, cultures that we may encounter are so far advanced and evolved in a sense beyond us that you know we're we're either viewed as you know insects or we're not enlightened enough to be to be like allowed into their level of society and uh, you know enlightenment actually on that point uh i i saw a uh, debate between uh, richard dawkins and uh neil degrasse tyson mm-hmm. they're discussing how uh, there's a one percent difference between chimpanzees and uh humans sure. and that we parade out the greatest of the chimpanzees those who can learn a little bit of sign language can do small tasks aliens would do the same thing with us yeah. uh, of course we'll parade like, out uh, stephen hawking who's able to do uh quantum uh mechanics in his head. calculations sure. calculations while uh like oh like our toddlers can um yeah and like that's a running theme i'd say going back to like you know the history of it even that has flowed in and out of many science fiction works like you know that's how Again, alien civilizations would almost view humans in that. Like, if they're so far advanced, of course, like, we'll be so rudimentary to them. See, but that's it's interesting that kind of viewpoint because it's a very linear viewpoint. It's yeah, uh, that, yes, of course, I agree. It's binary. Um, that intelligence would be ranked uh, um, as such as if we encountered a uh, an alien race that developed differently than we did, we might not be able to distinguish intelligence life between um, just an average beast where they wouldn't... It's not necessarily a a system of better. It's a system of so far gone that it wouldn't be able to be recognized. As far beyond mutants as they are beyond you. But that still presupposes... In a sense. But that statement presupposes that linearity. Agreed. Of course it does. Right. Well, that, that presupposition is that all intelligence is like human intelligence and is based on competition, Mm-hmm. Which may not necessarily, it's maybe okay. not, but it's probably a pretty good bet that competition kind of weeds out the, you know, weaker life forms. Um, it's kind of a, it's kind of a big deal here on Earth, anyway. I don't know about you know other planets, but I was going to say this. This I, I don't remember if it was this podcast or the last one we were talking about um, colonialism. We were talking about um, you know. Um, empires and so forth where this is basically what happens uh, you know in the history of mankind you know you come you know a more advanced society goes to a a lesser advanced society and they subjugate them until mm-hmm. that society can either stand on its own or in whether or is assimilated it, it, yes completely assimilated or it can stand on its own financially politically mm-hmm. or actually does a rebellion so like Again, what science fiction does is it's like instead of like, instead of like saying, you know, all humans are shit, they take the worst parts of the humans and make you know and make them aliens. Like, like they're like caricatures. Yeah, like, like monsters are doing Maple Street. The whole yeah, point of that sure. was the fact that man's is you know his his own worst enemy and can be easily manipulated. I mean, there's a whole history of that. Um, you know, even to what we did, the, what they did the Native Americans and so forth. Agreed. That's why Twilight Zone was fucking amazing. I well, think yeah. we all agree. That's why I've always liked science fiction that dealt with, uh, that didn't deal with a, a huge jump in time. Um, because I, get, I think the farther you go out, uh, the less, like, true your predictions can be. But when you deal with, like, a lot of the movies we deal with now are based on uh, a restraint on time. You have gravity. Uh, which dealt with a very realistic, uh, like true to life situation. Although, granted, the physics aren't necessarily one hundred percent, but it was close enough. Yeah, it's still it, it was science fiction without sure. um, that was a year or even present day. Or you deal with Interstellar, which is all based on, in a sense, what might be capable within a few years. You have Moon, which I brought up uh, on the first part, uh, the first part of this, which dealt with like logistics of what is possible in the near future 
when you do when you when, again when you go farther out, uh, it starts to uh, um, you, you start to ha- the necessity of placing human characteristics on th- things that might not necessarily act that way because we need to within our limited scope. Sure, agreed, and it's interesting because uh, you know again as filtered through tropes, so forth, etc. Like I think you might find this interesting. We've seen a kind of a drop off in that. So I'll, I'm going to bring up one thing. One of my favorite movies, perhaps you guys will agree, is Twelve Monkeys, which is one of my favorite sci-fi movies, still with time travel, etc. But the apocalypse happened in 1996 or whatever it was, right? I think like that was a bigger thing. Like, it, going back even further, like they would put a definite year upon, like in the year 20 XX or whatever it may be. Nowadays, like because it's sort of like farcical to us, like we look back, oh, oh, they said in the year 2001, all this crap, like. We've lived for ten years beyond that, so now I think like it's more it's a more nondescript kind of future. Well, one of my favorite uh, ones is uh, I think it's a movie called uh, Death Machine, which is in the distant future of nineteen ninety nine. So <laughs> yeah, well, th- again, yeah, of course, that's what Twelve Monkeys. Were. Again, like, but you've seen a lot of that, mm-hmm. but I think it's more dropped off because it's again it's become like a sort of a meta known thing unto itself that you shouldn't assign a year. Just make it not a script, and that somehow becomes more effective because it could be any year, well, and in the near future. We're in we're in the year of Back to the Future right now. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, and where's my fucking self zipping jacket, drying yeah. jacket, etc. Uh, I was gonna say what I thought was funny was Beth and I were discussing this because in the Star Trek universe in the '90s, you had the eugenics wars. Basically, mm-hmm. all these, you know, people, the you know, all these um, genetically enhanced, genetically created human beings, modified, yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. uh, you know, basically basically took over the world in various aspects and were overthrown and so forth. And I'm like thinking, well, that was supposed to happen in the nineties and in the nineties we're arguing over stem cells. I mean, it's just like, yeah, we technically do have the capability of, um, we definitely do have the capability of, you know, going there, doing something with regard to eugenics. But the cool thing that that's optimistic about society is that for one reason or another, everybody's finding an issue with we're dealing with the morality of the situation, whether it's stem cells, whether or not you agree with that, um, whether or not like, well, if you see, if you can tell that your child is going to, uh, be gay or have down syndrome, you know, will you abort it or will you change that person? And, and I think it's really, I think it's really funny that in, in some science fiction, even positive science fiction, like Star Trek, they've already taken a negative spin on it. Where in reality, it's just like, yeah, we're not there yet, fortunately, because we're still arguing over the basis issues. And I think sort of the ethics of some of yeah, this. Yeah, and I think that's kind of a good statement on today. Even more, you have a number of um, uh, films that deal with cloning. Um, uh, you have, again, I hate to keep bringing this up, Moon dealt uh, heavily yeah. with cloning. Uh, the Arnold Schwarzenegger yeah. flick, Six Day. It's one of the best ones that uh, did it, I, I think. Yeah, sure. <laughs> when, with Steve O's uh, Jurassic Park. Jurassic Park is Frankenstein with clones. I mean, it's cloning Frankenstein essentially on a bigger scale. Sure. It's like sort of, again, like, genetics is the new nuke. Like, that was yeah. like, it was, and that Jurassic Park yeah. was written in a time in, in which, like, that was, again, the mindset sort of, like, it, it was a newer ish science back in, like, late, mid to late 80s, et cetera. Well, Michael Crichton preyed upon uh, people's, people's fears. fears yeah, of, science. Uh, of course, and like that's why he was an effective sci-fi writer, I think. But let me bring this one up. I, you guys, I don't think we've mentioned it yet, and you just said about cloning. And Ga- Gattaca, I think, was one of my favorite oh, sci-fi yeah, movies definitely. ever. I think we might all agree, but it's sci-fi noir. It's written and acted, of course, extremely well. And there's a line in it. You remember this? Ethan Hawke says, it "Doesn't matter like what re- we've now gotten discrimination down, like literally to a science." <laughs> and like, I thought that like that's one of the most effective like messages like lines in any like speculative work ever, because that's something that a, like is very easily possibly done. Like if if you follow genetic engineering, it could be done. Like if you follow to its logical end in a sense, that's what's going to happen. And that's actually the that, and it goes back to the cloning thing, sort of almost. And that was done in an, an indeterminate future time, mm-hmm, exactly. But that there was is no exactly there was no year. Yeah, where we are today, those are the issues that they're directly. But they could talking. explore that. Stuff. Yeah, they could yeah. explore it. The Gattaca could very easily happen within the next twenty, thirty years. Yeah. Agreed. So you're dealing with. Uh, we started off in a sense with space, but we're drawing it back to the possibilities uh, on Earth. Uh, I think that's interesting because, uh, again, conceptually, although 
uh, NASA approved a budget mm-hmm. for exploring yep. Europa and um, uh, Titan, I believe. Uh, was next? Titan has a methane lake. Which, uh, you want to know what Titan is like this time of year? <laughs> From Gattaca? Yeah. Sorry, not uh, in my mind. Go on. And uh, also the sirens, if uh, Kurt Vonnegut is... Mm, yes, uh, that's right. Mm-hmm. Uh, correct. Um, <laughs> but we might find life outside of, uh in our in our solar system even mm-hmm. and our most basic um sure life forms so uh again if we find it in within our solar system that would exponentially increase the chance that until uh life exists outside i almost guarantee it if we find uh uh two or three uh, uh within our own area I was going to say that's the funny thing is because there's definitely, I mean, there's alien life on this planet that we like the sil- we have silicon based uh, creatures at the bottom of the, uh, we're still discovering support. life that yeah. we didn't even know about. Yeah. yeah. So what I'm saying is everybody always ex- on says planet. is there life in the universe? And this is like, they always figure it to be some like carbon based life forms is equal to intelligence when that may very not be the case. It's just that a lot of aliens, you know, the basic human can't really conceive of what an alien would be like. Actually, one of the most interesting questions was whether the life we find on other planets will have be DNA based. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, even so, that's a fascinating. Agreed. Like, that, of course, it's a great unknown, and something like many people are interested in exploring. You know, at, at, if you want to go down that road, and of course, it's a huge open question. Like, it's almost like. It's it's inc- like Fermi's paradox. I think is one of my you know favorite like concepts thing like he came up with. How come we don't see aliens? How come we haven't discovered aliens yet? There are many various explanations as to why not. And like of course because it's almost the anthropomorphic principle, right? We only have ourselves really like that we know of that are quote intelligent life that we have observed. So therefore, we're gonna by default be comparing everything else to that. But in no way does it ever like you know not necessarily at all have to be anywhere near that to find like other a quote t- intelligent life right? Actually, again going back to the, the richard dawkins and uh neil degrasse tyson debate uh richard dawkins said that um we can expect though evolutions of the more common evolutions on earth to likely to appear broadly amongst... apply yes that's true i mean like i heard him say that and i i would mostly agree with that Although that would but, depend on the again, environment of where they uh, develop, so sure. I think what it comes down to is like what what are the what are the components of whatever life it is, you know? Like you said, there's instead of carbon based life, there's we've already found silicon based life even on Earth, <clears throat> um, and on top of that, uh, what are the competition factors in wherever they? are developing and evolving which are complete unknowns i it, at, at this i point. would i would assume that it takes a massive amount of competition to evolve intelligent life because it's a ton of like evolving into f- figuring out how to you know i i mean it i guess it depends on what we talk about or what we call intelligent life well i would argue that do we call ourselves intelligent life I would argue that the average beetle has done less to destroy the world than the human has. True, it's relative, of course. It takes takes a ton of intelligence to destroy a world, all right? (laughs) Yeah. Or a giant asteroid. You gotta work on it. So we're more in common with the asteroid than we do with the base. I mean, I was just gonna say, like, everything we're discussing, like, from genetics to intelligence, I, I keep thinking about this conversation Beth and I had about standardized testing. That in a sense, like on a on a non genetic level, on like a like a uh, on a not on a non species within species, in our species, humans are trying to set the standard for what intelligent is. They are trying to quantify it. They are trying to qualify their own intelligence, it, and they can't. And that's the paradox because who is the arbiter of that? Of course, right? Exactly. I you can. I, I have. I had a friend in high school who decides who is and who is not acceptable, intelligent, or not. Of course. Yeah, I I knew of a girl in high school who was in you know was taking college math and science when she was in tenth grade. She was probably the most brilliant people you know when it came to mathematics, but when it came to other things, other things eluded her. And it's not like she was stupid. It's just like the way you would judge intelligence for her based on certain you know in in certain disciplines versus what mine might be like. Definitely, like, I'm more mechanically inclined. 
I'm more incl- mechanically inclined than like my dad was. My dad, sure. you know, was fun. sure. And what I'm saying is, how you know, how would you how would you judge somebody who's got equal book and they're not the same scale exactly so that so the intelligence is such an arbitrary thing i have quite a lot of esoteric pursuits um i like studying dead languages and (laughs) using esoteric words is one of those pursuits (laughs) and i always find it interesting that we value the obscure although uh, but the less practical um whereas i would argue that anyone who knows basic car mechanics has more useful skills than i do <laughs> practically uh, sure uh, but again though it's it's more impressive to speak latin than it is to uh have a more again practical skill sure I, i'll bring it back there's a line in 12 monkeys you guys may recall where uh dr Rayleigh really says psychologists are the new we decide who is sane and insane like w- yo we're the new religion yeah exactly that's exactly what they say and it, it it's broadly applied to everything you guys were just saying you know like there there's no how do we decide who is the arbiter of that? You know, it's very bizarre kind of decision. As you said, it's a paradox. I'm going to bring this back to the topic at hand, though. It's, it's, we kind uh, of went on a tangent. It's, you know, an immovable object meets, you know, unstoppable force. In science fiction, how, is, how do they define intelligence? Technology. Or, or, uh, or what's your favorite presentation of intelligence mm. in uh, science fiction? Wow. How much time do we have? <laughs> uh, yeah, we could have like a million podcasts about that, I guess, in a <clears> sense. <throat> um, well, I'll say this. I was going to say this earlier, and maybe I'll can, it applies right now. I've seen this in a number, like a number of like, specialists will say, why are humans the number, like we're the top predators, right? Nobody hunts us. So therefore, like, like, again, if we take that to be a measurement of success as a species, then you have to assume that another an alien civilization that is the top of their food chain is going to be you know aggressive towards us. I don't yeah, think that's, oh, yeah. I, I, w- I was going to disagree with that. I mean, before humans came along, the the only thing that it took to be the top of your food chain was to be the biggest and the strongest. And yes, I think that's that true. Would be most. I mean, would you call a T Rex intelligent? Because maybe it's based relative, on, of course, based on the science of their of the physiology of their bodies. They were like one of the stupidest stupidest animals. They were ever. scavengers. I was going to say, a there virus... There were enormous fucking scavengers that could murder anything that they saw. Coming back to the yeah. things, I, I was going to say, would you consider a violent, a, a virus intelligent? Because a virus, a virus can take out tons of people. Sure. Um, like in 12 Monkeys, of course. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> or name something. You know. Agreed. I mean, it's a living organism, right? So, yeah. Like, so it's... Yeah, trying to find... Sort of. Basis well, by which... that's debatable. <laughs> yeah. But I think it comes it's to... It's a like, biological organism. I think it comes from the bias of who's ever crafting whatever story you have you know whatever science fiction story you have what perspective they have on it um the issues they want to discuss within it you know because yes i believe what steve-o said that a lot of times in science fiction technology is a measurement of it but in a lot of better science fiction more um in-depth science fiction a lot of the times that's not always going to be the case sure yeah it becomes like you, know, you can throw a lot of things into it and you know, depending, of course, what you're going for and what, you know, sort of your bias or your message may be that you want to impart into your work that will inform what you're going to use and how you're going to use it in terms of that, those kinds of things. So long and thanks for all the fish. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, sort of like that. I was, I was going to say, and I, I know I bring, I know I bring up um, Star Trek a lot and I bring the Twilight Zone up a lot, but both of those things had the benefit of, a, a, a long expanse of time uh, and the collaboration of many different authors, a lot of different sure. viewpoints. Um, you know, especially Star Trek has generations of science fiction writers, science fiction knowledge. Um, and you, you know, with Twilight Zone, you had, you know, you had Richard Matheson, you had mm-hmm. a bunch of other, um, a lot of perspectives, a lot of viewpoints, a lot of different ways of looking at the same subject. Cause if you go down to a lot of these stories, a lot of science fiction stories, a lot of them are derivative from one another, and I mean that in the best possible way because where where the devil is, as I, I've been saying a lot lately, is in the details, and it's what that author of that story does with it. Of course, you know, like this is something we said in the in the introduction to brief history um, that Ian said something like, "There are no new like all the templates already exist. We'll just have new characters, but not really new narratives in that sense." You know what I mean? Like the stories are being retold. 
And as you say, it's just how you're telling them and you know what the nuances of that story are. Right. But I think you know the the two things you just said, like the two you know shows or series, like they were smart about no like a knowing that, and b like therefore having so many like nuanced ones, even if many of them, of course, you could see are like basically the same template of a story. Yeah, I was, I was actually gonna say, and this is gonna speak to a lot about it. I remember three things on TV, like three shows, not just commercials, but three shows watching when I was a kid between two and three. It was the, um, I saw Dolphins Jets game, and that's how I became a fan, Dolphins fan. I saw an episode of Star Trek called The Arena, where Captain Kirk fights the Goran on the mountain. Yeah, we, everyone knows that one by yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and then and, uh, your favorite Twilight Zone, the um, um, Time, Time Enough at Last, was like, so, so really, Star Trek and Twilight Zone really set Stop the it. stage for, you know, the way I was introduced to storytelling. It paved the path, in yeah. a sense. Sure. And in a sense, you had, you know, we, we had, you know, an apocalypse. We have a nuclear apocalypse in Twilight Zone. And then you have a colony that was destroyed by another alien. And, and a third alien kind of was trying to see which one would be more dominant. That's why I got the... That's why I got Kirk and the Gorn on the planet to see, you know, want them to iron out the the thing. So it, it's really funny. In two shows, I got a lot of the topics we were talking about: colonialism, you know, Armageddon. You know, it's sure they covered a lot, and be- yeah. be- because they like again, they they knew even though there's like a very sort of like narrow range, sort of templates, etc., to use, but the way they cut them each up, like again. It's depending what message you want to go for, what what issues in society you want to explore, filtered through those kinds of you know viewpoints. Even if it, you know it was speculative fiction, of course. However, the issues they were touching upon and exploring, the characters they were meant to represent, were very real issues, and each of which had a possibly different message, possibly like opposing messages sometimes. Okay, so we talked about science fiction a lot. And you had mentioned earlier in Star Trek had a eugenics war. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Fallout had a resource war. Mm-hmm. Which is sort of like broadly indicative of apocalypse stories, I would say. Or it's a thing that's used a lot, just as an aside. What do you think is the most likely future? The genetic or the resource? Resource. I think it's a mixture. Of, I think it's almost a race. It's a... Fi- I'm a betting man. Maybe maybe fans will know this now. I'm a gambling man. If I had to put odds on which one, it'd be like, I don't know, like 49 to 49. It'd be so fucking close. Because both of them, don't get me wrong, that's facetious on the surface, but there are both important things that we're racing towards. You know what I mean? I, I think it would depend which one you think is going to run out or like, you know, jump the next level first. I was gonna say I was gonna say my reason behind resources was because even for the genetic part you need certain you need resources. resources. That's true. Yes. I guess I guess he kind of went in that sense. I like that. But, but Chris also, Chris might have just won this argument but, here. But also, like if you were gonna talk colonialism and exploitation, you know, people <laughs> you, you, you the you know, joke is, you know, poor per- person would sell their kids to science. You know, sure. Pe- yeah. People can be exploited based on location. You know, culture. Whether you know how far less advanced they are um economic stature you know people can always exploit those so yeah you're simultaneously fighting a resource and a genetics thing but i think the resource is kind of gonna win out a little bit i was just gonna say uh i don't think it really matters where which one's first because the resource war is always gonna be the last one <laughs> well, <that's, laughs> i guess that's good, a good point it's a be all end all kind yeah. of yeah you know it we definitely, especially here, like on on Earth, there's a finite number of resources, and they're going to run out eventually. And it's the same with any other place. Like the longer you use something, it's going to eventually run out. There's no such thing as a never-ending planet. I actually have a uh, point to that, though. Uh, recently, a Europe, I believe, it was landed a probe on a comet. So uh, <clears throat> there's been discussion of um, fuck you, too, Scott. Um, <laughs> There's a um, so there'll be we'll be looking out into space for resources eventually. <clears throat> Whether we'll achieve that before we hit critical mass on Earth, still an open question. Sure, very big question. I was gonna say like again, really, yeah, you kind of stole it off on me. But think about this, right? If we have enough resources to pour pour into eugenics, then possibly like it's almost like you know you're getting more energy out. Not in that sense, but you know you can like 
you know, genetic engineering of foods, etc. You know, things like that. That would almost it, it would be its own weird, vicious cycle in which you create the resources in order to combat the loss of resources. Mm. I can see that. Right, but there's no like you can't just make something out of nothing. Sure, yeah, sure, exactly. Sure. Like you right. can make you more can make it, out of. You can something. make it more efficient. You could extend right. the resource war. But I do think you're right. I do like what something you said, Steve-O, is that at the end of the day, it's going to be about you know the resource, like yeah, right. the raw materials you can get we, yeah, in order no to produce whatever you need. No matter yes. who starts it, <laughs> yeah. your resources are gonna finish yeah. it. Yeah. Agreed. I mean, it all comes down. But it to is interesting mm-hmm. what you have and and what you can what you can make out of what you have. And I don't know. At some point, we're gonna come to the end of that for sure. True. But to Ian's point, yeah, yes, we will. Therefore, we may have to start mining you know, out into interstellar space, etc. You know, it'd be like a, it'd be like a, the introduction of Fight Club on planet Starbucks, etc. Or the thing from Alien, where everybody, uh, Wayne Utani, like now has a monopoly on mining all the asteroids yeah. or whatever. So, yeah. uh, well, I think we're gonna have uh, enough for right now. Uh, we discussed uh, prophecy as in, uh, or we try to at least. <laughs> we had a very lively discussion, but well, we kind of grounded it a little bit. Mm-hmm. And uh, prior to that, we discussed the apocalypse in um, in science fiction. So we covered the interstellar. Now we're bringing it a little bit. Uh, next time we're going to bring it a little bit back to Earth. And we're going to hang around the firmament a bit. Um, <laughs> this has been a uh, brief history of the end of days uh, with Scott Thurlo. I'll see you in Alpha Centauri. Steve Owen I'll see you guys later. And Christopher Morgan. And I bid you a good evening. I'm uh, Jonathan E. Mandry, and uh, we're signing off. Have a good night. This has been Syntax Error. Thank you, as always, for listening, and we will see you next time. Music by Stephen Armosi. Editing and engineering by Chris Morgan. Syntax Error is part of a Law Sigmas Productions. All rights reserved.